Okay, everyone. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, my, system, my PC had frozen and I had to reboot. So let's just go back to the slides where we had stopped in yesterday's class. So I thought maybe I'll just uh, uh, do some of the problems because some of you had been, uh, you know, asking me, had been sending me the uh, problems that you had solved. So instead of that, let's just, you know, uh, do those problems which I had given in yesterday's class. Okay. I'll quickly show that to you. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Just let me know when you can see my screen. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. So this was the problem. Okay. This was the problem that uh, problem which I had given you. The second and the third one. Let me just grab the second one. I think the first one we had already done. Question number one, we had already done. Go to question number two. Okay, so as usual, first thing that we do is we draw the this point. Okay, the 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 contour. The, we draw the contour first. So we have uh, modulus z equals one. What does that mean? It means we're talking about a circle of radius one, which is centered at the origin. So we are looking for a circle of radius one, which is centered at the origin. So, so let's say, okay, so we have a circle which is centered at the origin and has got a radius of one. So circle centered at the origin and with radius equal to one. Okay, so this is your contour C. Okay, so now this expression, so what we have here inside this, uh, G of Z is equal to Z cube minus six divided by Z cube minus six divided by 2z minus i, 2z minus i, we write this, we need to first write this in the form, in this form, that is some function f of z divided by z minus z naught, we need to write it in this form, because the moment we can write it in this form, then we can just apply the Cauchy integral theorem, either the Cauchy integral theorem or the Cauchy integral formula, which says that this is f of z divided by integral f of z divided by z minus z naught dz. This is equal to twice pi i into f of z naught. So we can use this and we can evaluate this. So we need to write it like this. Okay. So this one, so we have here g of z. So we have g of z this is equal to okay so first thing first is when you look at the form z is you know isolated here so we have to isolate z here so if i take this two into the numerator so we have z cube minus six z cube minus six this two goes up into the numerator that means i'm taking the two common okay i'm taking the two common here and what is left behind is z minus i by two z minus i by two so now you see if it is in this form Okay, it is in this form. So over here we write that this is equal to this is equal to f of z divided by f of z divided by z minus z naught. Okay, where this f of z we have now found out f of z is equal to z cube minus six divided by two. Z cube minus six divided by two and z naught is equal to you can see here z naught z naught is equal to i by 2 z naught is i by 2 okay do this first once that is done then check okay this is the first step okay this is step number one okay this is step one okay next step 
step two. Step two, you have to check, check if Z naught lies inside the contour C. You have to check if Z naught lies inside the contour C. Okay, then if yes, okay, there are two possibilities. If it lies, either it could be yes, either it could lie or it could not lie. Okay, so we have two possibilities here. So either this uh, Z, that is Z naught that we have identified, either it lies inside a C, that is yes, or it does not lie inside this. Okay, so if it lies inside the C, then we have to apply, then we have to apply the Cauchy's integral formula. Okay, and if it does not lie inside C, then we don't have to worry about this. We just apply the Cauchy integral theorem, and that is going to give us the result of the integral will be directly zero. Okay, so this is what we need to do. So in this case, where is Z naught? Z naught is I. So where is I? Sorry, Z naught is I by two. Now we see this is a circle of radius I, right? So what is this point on the real axis? This point is one, right? This point is one because the distance should be equal to one. This point is one. What is this point? This point is I. What is this point? This point is minus one. And what about this point? This point is minus I. So where is I by two? I by two is somewhere along the inner, along the imaginary axis. It's halfway between the origin and I. So I by two is over here. So this is my Z naught. Z naught, which is I by two. So in this in this case. Which is applicable? Which is applicable? The Cauchy integral formula or the Cauchy integral theorem? Which one do we apply? Anyone? Which one do we apply? The CIF or the CIT? CIF. The Cauchy integral formula because it lies inside this, so we have to apply this. So accordingly, so therefore, therefore. This integral that we have here, okay. This integral, therefore, this integral, integration, closed loop integral over C of z cube minus six divided by two z cube minus six divided by two, and the whole thing divided by Z minus I by 2 into dz. This will simply be equal to 2 into pi into I into f of z naught. And what is f of z naught? It will be f of z. F of this is f of z. Just uh, substitute. Wherever there is z, substitute z naught. Z naught is I by 2. So this will be equal to this will be equal to 2 into pi into I. 2 into pi into I times f of z, this function is here, this is f of z, okay, so this is what you'll have to apply, so here what is z, the value of z is i by 2, the value of z is i by 2, so we'll just go ahead and substitute that, so value of z is i by 2 whole cube, okay, and this is what you'll have to evaluate, has anybody done this, have you evaluated? These two will get cancelled, of course. Have you evaluated anybody? The answer should be, uh, the answer should be, I have already evaluated this. The answer should be uh, pi by 8. The answer should be pi by 8 minus 6 pi i. Okay. Please uh, verify this, okay? The answer should be pi by 8 minus 6 pi i. You get this, then that's the correct answer. Is this clear? Is this clear? Yes, sir. sir. Okay, yes, sir. so now let's go, let's go to the next. Yeah, let's go to the next problem. The next problem is this. Again, let me grab this. We have to integrate over each of these, okay? Okay. 
give me a second. I think I should be able to grab each of these individually. Just give me a second, okay? Okay, no, not what I'm looking for. I'll just go back. Okay, we'll proceed with this. So you have to integrate this anti-clockwise around four circles as shown. Okay, so again we'll follow the same steps. Again, we'll follow the same steps. So first let's look at C1. Okay, let's look at C1. So the function, I just write down the function. The function is the given function is g of z is equal to z square plus 1 z square plus 1 and divided by z square minus 1 okay so this is your g of z so we will now first look at each of these contours one by one okay that's what you have to do so first first is about the contour about the contour c1 so about the contour c1 let me just plot c1 so where is c1 c1 is this one okay it touches the it just touches the origin So this is C1, which just touches the origin, okay? C1, real Z, imaginary Z, okay? And then here we have, of course, C1, the center of C1. The center of C1 is 1. The center of C1 is 1, okay? So now uh, let's just uh, write this G of Z in this form. So remember, we have to write it in this form. G of Z has to be written in this form. F of Z, some function F of Z, divided by Z minus Z naught. It has to be written this way. So let's just go ahead and do that. G of Z is equal to Z square plus one divided by, okay? So in the denominator, don't we don't worry too much about the numerator. We just need to worry about the denominator. The, denominator how do we factorize this okay so how do we factorize the denominator so we have z square minus one so z square minus one can be written as z plus one and to z minus one so factorize it this way so z plus one into z minus one z plus one into z minus one so it means what this means is this means that g of z okay this g of z is not analytic. G of z is not analytic at z equals plus or minus 1. Okay. At these two points, it is not analytic. So essentially, what we have here is this. At this point, okay, this point, that is at plus 1, okay, at this point, z equals plus 1 is this point and z equals minus 1 which is this point okay minus 1 is here at these two points it is not analytic but we don't care about this plus or minus 1 okay let me draw it here so this is one point where it is not analytic and this is another point where it is not analytic you can see here uh, this uh, here, here. Uh, it, this only z equals plus one it lies inside okay only z equals plus one lies inside so only 
only z equals plus 1 lies within this contour c1 only z equals plus 1 lies within contour c1 so therefore we can rewrite this g of z we could rewrite it like this g of z because ultimately we have to write it in this form g of z can be written as z square plus 1 okay if i put z equals plus 1 z plus equals z equals plus 1 1 plus 1 this is going to give us 2 1 minus 1 this is going to give us 0 so this is the factor which will keep in the denominator and z plus 1 will take it up into the numerator so z plus z square plus 1 divided by z plus 1 and z minus 1 will leave it in the denominator so z minus 1 this is what we have here okay so from here when we look at it and when we compare with this standard form therefore this implies that f of z f of z is your z square plus 1 divided by z plus 1 this is your f of z okay so therefore if you want to integrate if you want to integrate over c1 this function g of z dz this is equal to integration over c1 f of z f of z which is in this case let's call this as f1 okay integration of f1 of z sorry integration of f1 of z dz divided by divided by z minus 1 z minus 1 which will be equal to which one do we apply cif or cit cif or cit which one do we apply here the formula yeah, yeah. the Cauchy integral formula again because the singularity is included inside there is a singularity inside so we'll apply cif so the formula will be the expression will be twice pi i 2 into pi into i into the value of the function at 1 okay so this will be equal to 2 pi i times so here we'll have 1 square plus 1 divided by 1 plus 1 1 square plus 1 is 1 plus 1 is 2 and this will get cancelled so eventually we'll be left behind this 2 pi i so this is the answer for the first one is that clear okay next along the contour c2 okay about the contour c2 about the contour c2 let's have a look just give me a second okay i seem to be getting a phone call Okay, back to this. So we have uh, C2, which is C2. C2 is this, right? It goes slightly off towards the left side, okay? So C2 is similar to C1. Okay, C2 is similar to C1, but only it gives goes slightly towards the left. Along C2, So C2 will be like this, slightly towards the left side. Okay. This is C2. Okay. Now we again find that C2 it contains the same singularity as C1. C2 contains the same singularity as C1, right? Okay. So C2 contains, so you can just write down here. So C2 contains the same singularity as 
as C1. Okay, so because it contains the same singularity as C1, so therefore we can use using yeah, using what is using the deformation of path using the deformation of path. Look at this. Look at the diagram here. I can always keep on deforming C1. I could keep on changing the shape of C1 until it becomes C2. Until it becomes C2. So by using the deformation of path, we say that the closed loop integral over over C1 of g of z dz. This will be equal to. There seems to be some disturbance. Somebody is Michael. There, there seems to be a disturbance from your side. Okay. So by deformation of path, so the closed loop integral of C two is equal to the closed loop integral of C one. You said. Okay. And uh, we have already found out what is the closed loop integral of G of Z over C one, which is equal to twice pi i. So in this case also, the answer will be simply. Twice pi i. Okay, so along contour C two is done. Next is along contour C three. About the contour C three. So again, diagram. Take it from here. Oops. So now for C three. C three is somewhere towards the left and towards the top. Okay, towards the left and towards the top. Towards the left and towards the top. I hope this is right. It's touching the imaginary axis. Okay. And then. We realize that uh, C three it contains the other singularity, which is at minus one. So C three contains the other singularity. C three the other singularity, which is minus one. Okay. So now again the same way, just like your uh, you know how we had gone about in C one. Okay, how we had gone about in C one. So here, in this case, let me just grab G of Z. Okay, so this is your G of Z. So now we have to write this in this format. So we can do it this way. This could be written as this could be written as oops. This could be written as okay. So now here the singularity is the singularity. C uh, Z equals minus one. Only Z equals minus one is contained inside C three, because only Z equals minus one is contained inside C three. If I put Z equals minus one here, it is be non-zero. But if I put minus one, it will be zero. So we'll put z plus one. We'll leave it, and only z minus one will take it up. So we have z square plus one, okay, divided by z minus one, and in the denominator we have z plus one. We have z plus one in the denominator. This is what it is. So let's call this as let's call this as f three z f three z divided by z. Plus one, or rather, we could write it as z minus z minus 
minus 1. Okay. We could write it like this. Once we have this, then it is very straightforward. So therefore, therefore, the closed loop integral over C3 of this function g of z dz, this will be equal to the closed loop integral over C3 of f3 z divided by z minus minus 1, z minus minus 1 into dz. And this is by using the Cauchy integral formula. This will be equal to twice pi i times f3 minus 1, f3 at minus 1, which is equal to twice pi i times, when you put f3, put minus 1, f3 is this entire thing. So that will be equal to minus 1 square plus 1, okay, divided by minus 1 minus 1. So here we'll have 1, minus 1 square is 1, so 1 plus 1 is uh, 2, and then we have minus 2, so this is going to give us a minus sign, so this will be equal to minus twice pi i. Is that clear? Okay, so this will be the value of the integral, okay, it will be minus twice pi i. And uh, the last one, about the contour C4, about the contour C4 where is C4? C4 is somewhere it touches, it goes to the origin and it touches the real axis. So C4 will be something like this. This is C4 and then here we have plus 1 and minus 1 on either side. So we have plus 1 and minus 1. And we have C4 over here. Okay, so immediately we know it's very straightforward because none of the singularities, none of the singularities lie within, none of the singularities lie within C4. So therefore, what will be the answer? using the Cauchy integral theorem, okay? If it does not lie, using Cauchy integral theorem, that means the function is uh, analytic everywhere inside C4. The function is analytic everywhere inside C4. If the function is analytic everywhere inside C4, then by Cauchy integral theorem, it's closed loop integral over C4, okay? This will be equal to zero. Is that clear? Is that clear to everyone? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Another scenario like this. Yeah. Okay. So, what if I have is another scenario like this? Let's just see five. Okay. If I have something like this, do any idea what we will do if we have something like this? If it contains both the singularities, any idea? Can you just take a guess as to what would happen in this case if the contour contains both the singularities? Can anyone think of some way by which you can evaluate this? Anybody? Think about it. What will happen here? 
Okay, I'll leave this to you as a homework. All right, everyone? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So this is your homework, okay? okay? What will happen in this case? Okay, sir. All right, do you need any hint or you can figure it out for yourself? The answer is there in the slides, okay? Just look at those slides, some previous slides, you'll get the answer, all right? Okay, sir. Okay, all right, I'll just give you a hint, okay, to make things easier for you. The hint is this, all right? Multiply connected domains. Okay, just think of how we had der derived this, how I showed you how to derive this result. Think about that and apply it in that case. Very similar. Just, there's a plus one here and there's a minus one here. So how will you go about doing this? See if you can use this formula, all right? So I'll not say anything more than this. So rest of this, I expect that you will uh, try it out on your own, okay? Try to solve this one, okay? So next, uh, uh, for derivatives, okay? So Cauchy integral theorem and the Cauchy integral formula, uh, the most general case, you could find out the derivative, okay? So if a uh, function f of z is analytic, okay, function f of z is analytic in a domain, a function f of z is, first of all, it is analytic in a domain, then it has got derivatives of all orders, okay? An analytic function, can be differentiated as many times as you want. That's why I said it has got derivatives of all order. Analytic function, if the function is analytic in a domain, it has derivatives of all orders. All orders means you can keep on differentiating the function again and again and again. Okay. Uh, if there's a fun if you can keep on differentiating a, a function again and again and again, what does it tell you about that function? Does anybody know? Suppose there is a function which I can go on differentiating again and again and again. What does that tell you about that function? If a function, if a function can be differentiated okay infinitely then the function has a fill in the blanks anybody then the function has a what Some representation. Uh, yes. Transcendental functions. Transcendental functions. Uh, what are transcendental functions? So it was derivative, sir. Uh, but I remember the derivatives don't vanish. Like if you keep on differentiating. Okay, but why do they not vanish? Why do they not vanish? That's what I'm asking. Why do the derivatives not vanish? Because they have some kind of a representation. They can be represented in a special way. What is that representation? Parametric. They have a power series representation. Think about it, okay? Think about it, okay? Yes, Suppose I have a function f of z, okay? And I say that this function f of z has got a power series representation. That means f of z can be written as a0, right? Plus a1z, a0, a1, they are co coefficients which we can find out. a2z square plus a3z cube plus a4 z to the power 4 and so on right what will be f prime z what will this be what will be f prime z differential of a0 is anyway zero 
differentiation of this will be a1 differentiation of this will be twice a2 z differentiation of this will be thrice a3 z square differentiation of this will be 4 a4 z cube next one will be 5 a5 z to the power 4 and so on right agree now nothing is stopping me from changing the names no a1 is some coefficient let's call this coefficient as b1 right a1 is some coefficient i call this coefficient b1 no problem twice a2 twice a2 sorry i call this as this coefficient a1 i'll call i'll rename it i'll call it as b0 this coefficient twice a2 i'll call let me call it as b1 this coefficient 3 a3 let me call it as b2 this coefficient 4 a4 let me call it as b3 this coefficient let me call it as b4 right i could do that now but then what is the difference between this one and this one you see this function f of z is a power series right because this is the meaning of a power series no you should be able to write this as a infinite sum of all powers of z that's the meaning of a power series so if i'm able to write f of z in this way that means it's a power series but what about f prime z is this a power series or not same thing no some coefficient plus some coefficient into z plus some coefficient into z square plus some coefficient into z cube same thing this is also a power series yes or no right everyone is this clear yes, yes sir so yes, sir. therefore what about f double prime what about f double prime z what will this be equal to differentiation of b0 is 0 differentiation of this will be b1 z sorry this one differentiation of this will be simply b1 differentiation of this will be twice b2 z differentiation of this will be thrice b3 z square plus 4 b4 z cube and so on and which i could there is nothing stopping me from redefining it i'll call it as c0 plus this c1 z plus c2 z square plus c3 z cube and so on this is also a power series right okay so no this is also a power series so i could go on differentiating okay eventually this I could differentiate it n number of times. This also a power series. This also is a power series. Is that clear? Is that clear? Yes. So what we have learned from here yes, is sir. yes, sir. Yeah. It, that means you can uh, you can differentiate if you can differentiate infinitely if you can differentiate something infinitely if you can differentiate something infinitely what it means is you are having derivatives of all orders if if you can differentiate something infinitely you are having derivatives of all possible orders okay so if a function has let's go backwards now if a function has power series representation it can be differentiated infinitely if it can be differentiated infinitely that means it has got derivatives of all orders if it has got derivatives of all orders, that means it's a analytic function. So by the flow of logic, okay, by the flow of logic, an analytic function will have a power series representation. Okay, is this understood? If a function yes. is analytic, it can be represented as a power series. Fine. In fact, that is what we are going to do next. After this is done, the next lesson will be on uh, complex series. In complex series, we will look at this power series representation of analytic functions. This is why analyticity is so very important. Okay, analyticity is so important because using the idea of analyticity, you can keep on differentiating. If a function is analytic, then it's special because you can go on differentiating again and again and again. 
if you can differentiate it again and again and again that means it has got a power series representation power series representations they are very easy to work with because power series representation very easy to work with because they are all you know polynomials no they are all made up of polynomials and differentiation and integration of polynomials is extremely easy so analysis of such functions analysis of such functions is very easy because analysis of polynomials is extremely easy analysis hence the name what's the name of the function it's called analytic for this reason okay because you can analyze this function very easily such functions can be analyzed very easily because they have power series representations so you can differentiate you can integrate you can do anything you want they are all made up of polynomials so you can do whatever you want you can differentiate or integrate them in other words the analysis of such functions are extremely easy so that's why they they are known as analytic functions is that clear everyone did you get this point Yes, sir. Okay, so let me just put this in one of the slides. All right. So coming back to this. So if a function is analytic in a domain D, it has derivatives of all possible orders in the same domain D. Okay. and which are also and each of these derivatives are also analytic we just saw right if a function f is you know uh, if the function f is analytic then it can be differentiated and its derivative is f prime f prime is also having a power series representation so by that same logic no an analytic function will have a power series representation and vice versa so f prime the derivative also has got a power series representation so f prime is also analytic so each and every derivative each and every derivative will also be analytic function okay then the values of these derivatives we can find out the values of these uh, derivatives uh, i think there is a mistake in the formula here they should be uh, okay this, but this is anyway zero so that's fine so the values of these derivatives so let's say i want to find out you know f prime at some point z not f double prime at z not okay so we could also write f zero of z not f zero is nothing but the function itself f0 is nothing but the function itself f f prime is nothing but df by dz f double prime is d square f by dz square okay so we have the function itself this is not zeroth derivative okay this is the zeroth derivative this is known as the this zeroth derivative the function itself is the zeroth derivative then we have the first derivative we have the first derivative okay which is f prime z not then we have the second and the nth derivative the second derivative the nth derivative the nth derivative so this is the formula in general you just need to remember this formula this is a formula that we need to remember the formula is the value of the nth derivative of the function at z not the value of the nth derivative of the function at z not is equal to n factorial by twice pi i times the closed loop integral of f of z divided by z minus z not to the power n plus 1 where n is equal to 0 1 2 3 4 and so on so this is basically from the cauchy integral formula you can very easily obtain this using the cauchy integral formula so cauchy integral formula not only does it give you because uh, not only does it give you because you can see here this is actually the cauchy integral formula can you see how cauchy integral formula because zero factorial is 1 right zero factorial is 1 so when you bring it on this side this 2 pi i when it bring it on to the other side so you'll get 2 pi i into f of z not so this is equal to what is left on the right hand side closed loop integral of c f z divided by z minus z not into dz so this is your cauchy integral formula right this is bringing this 2 pi i onto the other side so you get this okay now going back here let's now see the proof of this one okay so this is what we have to prove we have to prove that the nth derivative of z not is equal to n factorial by twice pi i into the closed loop integral of f of z by z minus z not to the power 
n plus 1 okay okay so uh, what we can do is the this can be proved through differentiation under the integral sign differentiation under the integral sign if you do that then you can very easily prove this okay so the, from the cauchy's integral formula we have this we start from the cauchy's integral formula this is the cauchy's integral formula then uh, from this equation number one what we do is we replace uh, z with sorry we replace uh, this one z naught with z naught plus delta so here what we do is in the cauchy integral formula over here this z naught will replace with z naught plus delta z okay we replace this with z naught with z naught plus delta z so here we, the argument because z naught plus delta z and here we have f of z then z minus z naught this z naught i replace it with you know uh, z naught plus delta z because there is a minus sign so both of these become minus so that's what we do here then what we will do now, now is we'll find out the difference quotient that is this minus this okay this equation that we have the first equation sorry the second equation the left hand side the second equation minus the first equation this equation minus this divided by delta z okay so f of z naught plus delta z minus f of z naught divided by delta z so that will be equal to this integral minus this integral and of course you have to divide by delta z so what i did was one by twice pi i you took it common one by twice pi i you take it common and because i'm dividing by delta z i put a delta z here and inside the integral inside the integral we'll have this one f of z we take it outside because f of z is common here so f of z we take it outside and then what will be left behind is only the denominator so 1 by z minus z naught minus delta z minus 1 by z minus z naught so this is what we did just the basic uh, man algebraic uh, manipulation that's all okay everybody clear with this is this okay yes sir to everyone uh, yes, okay. yes. So this is what we got. Okay. Yeah. So this is what we yes, got. Sir. So now what we do is we just add these two together. So this is easy because the LCM will be this multiplied by this. Okay. The LCM will be this multiplied by this. That is your LCM. And then when you divide by this, then what is left behind is Z minus Z naught. So Z minus Z naught comes here. Z minus Z naught. And then minus when you divide by Z minus Z naught. So this will be left. So minus. Uh, z minus z plus z naught plus delta z okay this is what we have and we can see immediately that some of these will get cancelled out uh, plus z and here plus z and minus z will get cancelled out this plus z and minus z will get cancelled out and minus z naught and plus z naught will get cancelled out and as a result only delta z is going to remain here okay so this is the delta z okay so uh what we do is again we get this f of z we bring this back over here and we also again see that this delta z will cancel out this delta z okay so as a result this is what we have here f of z we bring it back here into the numerator so one by twice pi i f of z divided by z minus z naught minus delta z z minus z naught into that dz okay then here what we do is we add and subtract okay plus 1 by twice pi i, we just add and subtract this quantity. f of z dz by my divided by z minus z naught square minus the same thing. We just add and subtract. No harm, right? No problem. We can just do that. Now, once we have added and subtracted this, then we now to do some little bit of reorganization. So what we do is, this quantity okay this integral okay with the plus sign we'll bring it here up front and uh, these two integrals we'll just combine them together let me use some other color <coughs> so these two integrals that is this one and uh, this one Okay. we'll put them together inside the bracket here okay so this is what we have here so we bring this front and these two we combine over here okay so we'll, once again this f of z we take it a common outside and then what is left behind is one divided by this entire thing one divided by this entire thing and there's a minus sign here minus 
1 divided by z minus z not whole square okay now again you know uh, add these two okay sorry subtract these two evaluate this so the first integral we'll just keep it as it is okay the first integral that is this integral we'll keep it as it is and here we will have uh, z, when you take the lcm when you take the lcm we will get z minus z not this entire thing into z minus z not square okay and then over here when you divide this entire thing when you divide by this then this uh, factor is going to cancel out and this one one of these powers will go Okay, so only z minus z naught will be there. So here we'll get one minus this one will be replaced with z minus z naught minus when you divide this entire thing with this, then z minus z naught square will get cancelled. So what is left behind with this minus z plus z naught plus delta z. Okay, so this is what is left behind. So now again, just like in the previous case, this z and this z will get cancelled. This z naught and this z naught also will. Get cancelled. Okay, so these get cancelled. So what is finally left behind is delta z. Okay, now delta z. The integration is done with respect to the with respect to z, not with respect to delta z, because delta z is arbitrary. It is independent of your dz. So we could as well as well take this delta z. We could just bring this outside the integral, and that's what is done over here. So this delta z that was here, it has been brought outside the integral. And this f of z dz we write it like this. Okay, so this is the expression. So now you can see here what are we trying to evaluate? We are trying to evaluate the derivative, right? We are trying to evaluate the derivative. Now think about it. Okay, just think about this. What do we have on the left hand side? On the left hand side we have f of z not plus delta z, okay, minus f of z not, and the whole thing divided by delta z. So if I take this entire thing, if I take a limit as delta z tends to zero, if I take delta z tends to zero, then this is going to give me df by dz evaluated at z equals z naught because you know z naught is what we're considering here. So in other words, this is going to give me f prime at z naught. This is what is going to give me. Okay. This is what will give me, and then as per the theorem, what is f prime z naught is supposed to be? F prime z naught, what is it supposed to be? It is supposed to be this quantity, one factorial by twice pi i into. This is supposed to be. Let me write down here. So this is supposed to be. This is supposed to be equal to one factorial divided by twice pi i. Okay, I'm just writing this down here. Closed loop integral of uh, f of z. Divided by z minus z not square into dz, right? So this quantity is supposed to be equal to this. And over here, if you look at it, if you go back to that slide, Yes, here it is. Okay, so if you go back to this particular slide, you can see here this quantity. You can see here this quantity. Let me use some other color. Okay, this quantity, this entire quantity that we have, is the same as this quantity. Right, it's the same as this quantity. So, if and the, what is there on the left hand side? What is there on the left hand side? The left hand side is that quantity which, if I take the limit as delta z tends to zero, if I take this quantity, if I take the limit as delta z tends to zero, it will give me this. It will give me the derivative. If I take the limit as delta z tends to zero, it will give me the derivative. And on the right hand side, we have two terms. We have this quantity and this quantity. This quantity that we see here, which is the same as this. Is equal to whatever is supposed to be on the right hand side. Okay, and you can see this quantity is independent of your delta z. So if I make delta z tends towards zero, this will remain unaffected. Okay, if I make delta z tends towards zero, this this term is independent of delta z. So when I make delta z tends towards zero, this will be unaffected. So essentially, what we need to show is this. If we can show, okay, if we can show, we need to show this. We need to show. Okay, we need to show that if I take the limit as 
delta z tends towards zero okay of the on the lhs okay on the lhs i take as limit delta z tends towards zero on the lhs this will be equal to this quantity on the right hand side which is 1 by uh, 2 pi i okay integration f dz by uh, z minus z not square this is what we have on the right hand side plus we have limit as delta z tends to zero because this limit is not going to affect this it is independent of delta z and what we'll have here is this entire quantity okay the second term the second term and if we can show that as delta z tends towards zero if this also tends towards zero as delta z tends towards zero if this tends to zero then this will prove that f prime at z not is equal to this 1 by 2 pi i and so on okay so effectively what is the next thing that we have to do next thing we have to consider the second integral the second term that we have here and this second term if we can show that as delta z tends towards zero the second term will also tend towards zero okay but this is not so easy as it looks because you could just argue that okay there is a z, delta z in the numerator right i could just make it zero then zero into anything is zero but then you have to remember that there is a delta z in the denominator inside the integral also so it is not so straightforward as simply assuming that this is going to go towards zero because right this is going to become extremely small right so we need to take care of all of these okay so that's what we are going to prove now okay Can I just take uh, five more minutes? It's two o'clock now. Do you have any class? All of you? No, sir. No class. So I can no, just sir. take five more minutes. No, you don't mind, right? Is that okay? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, great. So we have this quantity. So what is the challenge now? The challenge, the challenge is we have to show that this second term will go towards zero. Okay, we have to show that this tends to zero as delta z tends towards zero. This is what we have to prove now. Okay, so for that, what we do is, of course, again, we have to go back to our ML inequality. Okay, so very useful, right? We use this everywhere. So we go back to our ML inequality. Okay, we go back to our ML inequality. So what we do is this, because f is analytic, because f of z is analytic, that means there is going to be some upper limit on f, okay, because f is analytic, so that means this is guaranteed, this we know that will happen, there is an upper limit of the function f on this contour c, and l is the length of the path, l is the length of the path, then let's say d0, d0 is the minimum value of z minus z0, okay, so what it means is basically this. Uh, so we have, let's say, I have this contour. Let's say the contour can be of can be of any shape. Okay, this is a contour, which can be of any shape. Let's say this is the contour C, and this is your Z naught. This is your Z naught. So what this means is, suppose I take a Z value here, I take a Z value over here, then this distance between these two points, okay, this distance between these two points, this distance is Z minus Z naught. This distance is z minus z naught. Okay, distance between any two points is more or less z minus z naught. So what we are having here is d zero. D zero is the minimum distance, the minimum distance between the contour and the central point. So which is the minimum distance? So probably this point. Okay, probably this point. This point is the minimum distance. So this is your d zero, the minimum possible distance. Is that clear? Okay, so this is the this is the meaning of d0. D0 is the minimum possible distance between the point z0 and a point on the contour. Okay, then we can just apply the ML inequality on the second integral of the left hand side. That is on this left hand side, we can just apply the ML inequality on the second term. Okay, and when you do that, this is what you get. This is what you get. So 1 by twice pi i, forget about it because it's a constant. So we have delta of, okay, we have delta, we have delta z then integral of f of z dz and this entire quantity this will be less than m into l okay just see how this happens okay 
this quantity, this function, f of z, okay, this is going to give us n because this f of z has got an upper limit. So this m comes from here. Okay, then uh, this one by one by z minus z naught minus delta z. Okay, one by z minus z naught minus delta z. What is this going to give us? This is going to give us because you see we have assumed this minimum z minus z naught. That means z minus z naught. This modulus will always be greater than d zero, right? Because d zero is the minimum value, no? D zero is the minimum value. So for any point, the z minus z naught will be greater than d zero. So if that is the case, then one by z minus z naught will be less than one by d zero. Okay, so this is going to give us this z minus z naught is I'll just replace it with d zero minus just the modulus of delta z. Okay, this z minus z naught is going to give us one by d zero, and it will be less. There will be a less than symbol because z minus z naught is greater than d zero, so one by z minus z naught will be less than one by d zero. Okay, so z minus z naught is going to contribute this one by d zero minus delta z. And the last one that is one by z minus z naught square. This term, in yeah, this last term, this is going to give us simply one by d zero square because z minus z naught modulus of this is, you know, is greater than d zero. So one by that. So one by d naught square. So when you combine these together, okay, when you combine these three together, when you combine these three together, what you're going to get? We will get in the numerator. We will get a m here, and in the denominator, we will get d zero square. We will get a d zero square, and we have d zero minus modulus delta z. So this is what we will get, right? So this is the this is the upper limit of the integrand. This integrand that we have here. This integrand that we have here. The upper limit. This integrand. This one's upper limit. This is the upper limit, and then what is the length of the path? The length of the path is L. The length of the path is L. So all you need to do is when you apply the ML inequality, this integrand, the result will be less than this into L. So one more L is going to come here. So M into L d naught square divided by d naught minus modulus of delta z, and there is a delta z here. You take the modulus of that also. Is that clear? Is that clear? Yes, sir. Okay. So now coming back to this. Okay, this is from the ML inequality. So now we can just have a look at this. Delta z, if I, if it tends to zero, delta z when it tends to zero, the denominator what will happen? The denominator when delta z tends towards zero, the denominator will just tend towards D not cube, right? When delta z tends towards zero, this is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So d not square into d not will tend towards d not cube. But what about the numerator? This numerator will tend towards zero because this is tending towards zero. So ml this will also tend towards zero. So there you have it. That's the proof. So we have proved that as you know delta z tends to zero, then this quantity, this integrand, that is also going to tend towards zero. Okay, so as you take the limit, as delta z tends towards zero, so we have this is going to become zero, and when you take the limit here, this is going to give us the derivative f prime z naught. Okay, and that is going to give us one by twice pi i f of z divided by z minus z naught square. So this proves that the derivative will be like this. This is how the derivative is going to look like. Is that clear? Okay, so higher order derivatives also you can obtain in a similar manner. Okay, so I think we can stop here today. If you have any questions, you may ask me.